Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy, where we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and apply it to the questions you deal with every day. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. I'm Anastasia here with Mike and John, and despite my struggles here, uh, we are going eventually to talk about intelligence. Intelligence, something yes. that you apparently don't have because you can't operate. Hey, I a, figured it out. You I'm you figuring did. You, it out. You did. You did. Passing her test. She's passing her. Woo! Her Dang. IQ test is whether or not she can set up her uh, her tablet or not. Okay. Shut the fuck up, Mike. What are we drinking today? I was going to ask that. I beat you to it, bitch. You did. Hey, calm down. We are drinking something shady. From the Texas Ale Project in Dallas, Texas. Would you look at this can? This is an awesome, oh, awesome yeah. can. You just like that there's a hot girl making a kissy face. I do. You. I do like that. I'm, I'm just going to keep that right here. It's not a duck face. I'm happy. <laughs> This is a porter, and it says, with sublime roasted malts. Yep, and it's 5.5%. So 5. what 5. is the difference between a kissy face and a duck face? I don't kiss ducks. Oh. Okay. On a kissy face, you have to move in to get the kiss. On a duck face, you can get it from a mile away. You've been kissing a lot what? of ducks? <laughs> yeah, you don't kiss ducks. Well, <laughs> there's got to be a lot of alcohol involved. That's how I get good insurance rates. <laughs> You're not ki- kissing geckos? Nah. Uh, Never mind the fact that we actually have Geico. That's not bad. That's not bad at all. All right. I haven't tried it yet. So, um, we, whenever this kind of idea came up, um, it was spurred from looking at, um, IQ tests. Yep. Now, as it evolved, I actually kind of wanted to take a look at intelligence itself, um, through the lens of IQ tests. Um, so I guess to get started, what is intelligence? Uh, you want my definition? Yeah. Uh, I think intelligence is the ability to predict the future in such a way that is useful in manipulating it to get what you want accomplished. That's to the worst. The future? That is the worst definition I've ever heard. Really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What do you think it is? I think it's figuring shit out. Um, I, what, I, what kind of shit? I, 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 I think uh, I always use the. I tell people all the time that 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 I'm. I'm not smart. I know a lot of shit, but don't ask me to figure stuff out. I don't. I, I, just, I just don't. I don't. I don't have that in me. My son is smart. He can just figure shit out. That's intelligence, which is why I refuse to take an IQ test because I'm afraid to find out how stupid I am. I, I am forty something years old, and I, how old am I? I'm forty six, <laughs> and I haven't ever taken an IQ test. Oh, okay. That I know of. I don't remember uh, taking one. I think I have, but I don't remember. I've taken a few. Yes. Um, So the dictionary definition is the ability to acquire or apply knowledge or skills. Figure Um, shit out. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and it's, it actually is not just figuring shit out, but also gathering and retaining that knowledge. Pretty good at that. Yeah. Um, Which I think will be. So I'm a half a moron. (laughs) Or or half a Mensa. I don't know. One of the two. (laughs) One of the two. Um, There's not much of a difference. (laughs) (laughs) Damn, John. So um, it's actually been really interesting. Uh, Some of the conversations that uh, we've been having lately, um, John and I were watching, or I guess John was watching a video and I was eavesdropping I, yeah that's what yeah. i was doing that's what i do best um i wish that was a measure in <laughs> iq test i would score so well but you were um, one of those people that back back in the days when there was party lines you would have picked the phone up and listened wouldn't you i would have what on the party lines you would have picked oh, up the phone yes. and listened. Yeah, yeah no my it fun story um so my mom used to work like a dick load of hours and yes that's that's the measurement that's we're going to use measurement standard, yes. yes um and so at the time, I was an only child, and she wanted to make Ah, uh, sure. the good old days. <laughs> Before that asshole brother of yours came along. You mean the guy running our stream right now? Oh, shit. I forgot he was here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but no, I was an only child. She was working a lot of hours, and it was important f- to her to maintain our uh, closeness. You know, she didn't want me to feel like I was growing up without a mom. I think I failed my IQ test, too. I had my headphones on backwards. Uh-oh. I knew they sounded funny. You, you did too. <laughs> I was the only one that didn't. I was sitting here going, these don't feel right. Yeah. Yeah, they felt a little backwards. This is better. <laughs> so anyway. Um, so because of that, we would go on these um, mother-daughter outings. And we would kind of spend the day hanging out together. And 
one of the things that I learned best from those outings was how to eavesdrop on people. <laughs> and so there would be somebody like across the restaurant who was having an interesting looking conversation yeah, yeah. and she would teach me how to like <laughs> casually turn to see them rather than what my, my, uh, sweet brother would do and go, what? <laughs> and <laughs> be very obvious. Of course, I, I did that the first few times too, if I'm honest. You got to learn, you got to learn how to do it, do it very casually. Yeah. Make that slow stroll by the table to listen. Yeah. Have some reason to turn around or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's actually totally off topic, but that, I don't know. You, that were, you were figuring shit out. So, you know, that is yeah. true. Um, but no, that, that was, one of my biggest takeaways from our mother-daughter outings was how to eavesdrop. So anyway, um, in, okay, I was talking about that video that I was eavesdropping on. Um, the guy was going around and he was doing kind of a man on the street interview. And he would ask questions like, where is Ohio? Or uh, point to Africa on this world map or something like that. Um, and then the last question that he asked all of these people was, do you think you're stupid? And it kind of got me to thinking, like, that's a really fucked up question. Because a person can have really poor geographic knowledge, but be intimately yeah, um, there, knowledgeable on, I don't know, particle physics. There's a difference between stupidity and ignorance. There is. Yeah. You can be very ignorant on a subject. Well, and... And I think what it, it starts to elucidate is the ways that we uh, quantify intelligence socially. Um, we tend to expect somebody to be really well-versed in a lot of things. Um, and so somebody who maybe has a gross amount of expertise in a particular subject, but... Uh, can't figure out how crossing uh, street things work when you're crossing them and you press the button. Yeah, yeah. Whatever those Crosswalk. are Crosswalk? Well, that's that's the painting on the road. But yeah. The whatever. light. The signals, yeah. yes. Um, can't figure out how that stuff works. Or can't recall what they're called, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's going to be a good show. But yeah, so if we observe those people interacting um, with the world on a daily basis, um, we might think that they're an idiot when they are really one of the most renowned people in their field. Um, and so that's kind of where I wanted to go from here is what is intelligence? Is it measurable? Is there a, uh, an overarching intelligence that, um, that people have that can be measured? Um, or is it something much more nuanced than that? So with that, um, I actually wanted to kind of take a look at what you guys would incorporate into your own IQ test were you to, or your own intelligence test, um, were you to create one. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm interested in John's answer because he, he believes that an IQ is your ability to foretell the future. So I'm, I'm <laughs> curious. Yeah. So... Um, I, I, I can think of a couple things, uh, and and I think we have to ask: uh, Should an IQ test be something you sit down and, and you're done with, or should it be like a month long or, ordeal? That's a good point. Um, yeah. So should I mean, it be observing your everyday life, or yeah, yeah, if we're looking at a month long ordeal, I think a great IQ test is to uh, go out, give them ten thousand fake dollars, and invest in the stock market. You got to do the research. You got to figure out what's going on. You can do it in a multitude of fields. Yeah, but you're still only measuring one aspect of it, right? Well, I mean... Um, what I don't think it should be is, is trivia. I don't think it should yeah. be recalling facts. Yeah. Okay. So, yes, you're, you're, you're only measuring the skill in one... Now, maybe, again... Now, I guess you could argue for... Maybe you go out and, and take $10,000 and, and go on the stock market, and you also try to... Uh, manage a business and you also try to um, go out and and put an engine together yeah and you do everything and then you have to score well but 
It's kind of that sounds kind of like the ASVAB test, where they're measuring your your proficiencies and you know that they give you the, the cogs and the gears. And which one of these has the most drag on it? And they're looking at that, trying to figure out whether you which can one do, of these buckets fills up first yeah, well, if they're that, aligned but, in but this that's, way. That's something that you've got to you've got to to use reasoning to figure stuff out. Well, and and I I think honestly the best IQ test there is, and it, it's very hard to quantify quickly, which is is kind of where IQ test mm-hmm. you want to evaluate somebody quickly is to, you know, talk to somebody and ask them what their life goals are, mm-hmm. whether it's happiness, job success, family life, or money, and then see how well they achieve those goals, yep. whatever that is. Mm-hmm. Now, you could say you could always use money, but if somebody doesn't care about getting money, yeah. then, you know, they'll, they'll never do well at that, you know? Yeah, if you, were, if you had endless amounts of time, I think yeah. you could come up with a, you know, you could put an escape room, you could put in, uh, you know, mysteries, yeah. you could, where they got to figure stuff out, you could also... You know, put in your your cogs and stuff. You mm-hmm. could, but but you know, re- realistically, you know, if you're talking about a one time test, yeah, right. What would you put on a one time test? Because I I like the, the the idea of of the mechanical side of it, where you've got to look at things and you've got to figure out, you know, which gear has the most drag and what. Mm-hmm. That that makes sense to me. That that's a, that's an intelligence measurement. Yeah. Well, and and you know, the, all of that kind of you know gets back and and maybe I'm I'm pulling off subject here a little bit to to where my definition goes because. Uh, like you said, um, maybe you're not mechanically proficient, but maybe you're really good with uh, 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 equations, right? You're really yeah. good with math. Um, but I think the ability to take in information about an, a subject, whether it be how these gears go together or whatever, and take all that information and then make a prediction yeah. about how things will go before I start moving the gears around. I need to take in the information, make a prediction about the future. And my prediction needs to be accurate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and then actually act upon that. I think it's down to the heart of it. In fact, one of the most intelligent people in the world that, that we all still, still talk about is Einstein, right? Yeah, yeah. What was he renowned for? He looked at some math and made profound predictions about how the universe works without, having the test to do that he made a prediction about if we do these tests these will become the outcomes yeah. and I, I think that is intelligence he was scary smart <laughs> yeah he, he was he was able to make predictions that you look at them and you go how the fuck did you come up with that have you ever read anything read much about him uh, I've read a little about yeah, him the, yeah. uh, uh, one of the most interesting stories I ever heard of him was that they asked him about, uh, about his childhood and he said, uh, they asked him something to the effect of, when did you first know you were different? And he said he was like eight years old. <laughs> and he said, the question that I, was at, that, I, that, I, that was pondering my mind at eight years old was, what would the world look like if I, rode on the, on, if I was riding on a beam of light? What would the universe look like? Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, at eight years old, I'm thinking to myself, is sco- what's, what's in a Scooby snack, you know? And this guy's a- like asking these that, questions. Actually. Here's- pot. It's pot. <laughs> what's oh, is in it? It? It's got to be. <laughs> Have you seen Shaggy? There's a reason Shaggy's eating the Scooby Snacks. Fair point. Here's a point on the IQ test that I think is severely lacking right now and that we we tend to overlook, and, and I don't really understand why, because it tends to be uh, highly influential in someone's long-term success, and that's social intelligence. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, your ability to take an idea in your head, look at somebody else, evaluate their situation, and then rework that idea in a way that they will be empathetic to and communicate effectively to yeah. them what you're thinking. Yeah. Uh, very important in politics, very important in business, sure. very important in many aspects, yet we almost never test yeah. it it's, in any kind of It's the only way to explain Rick Perry and George W. Bush. Yeah. yeah. That's... Uh, Trump, for that matter. That's termed emotional intelligence. Yeah. Well, I mean... Which it, yeah. is yeah. actually, and, and we'll get there, there in a little there bit. Is, there is an EQ test. Uh, there is, um, but that is something that in the last 20 years... Um, we have begun to actually explore more, um, realizing that there are people who um, can become very successful with lesser degrees on these, um, lesser scores on these IQ tests, um, but who do really well at uh, analyzing their own emotions, the emotions yeah. of others, um, and relating to other people there's a there's a youtube uh video out there called like like maps that'll blow your mind or something i've forgotten what it was but there's two maps on there i just watched the other day and one is a world global map of iq scores and one is eq scores Mm -hmm. and uh on iq scores india and china outscore everybody by the way 
uh, the U.S., while I would have thought we would have been, been lower, we're right behind India and China. Mm-hmm. They're, they're up there, and then there's the U.S., Canada, and England that are right there together. Mm-hmm. Uh, but on EQ, those two countries that had high IQ scored very, very low. Right. And uh, that was it was interesting to me. How did we do? Uh, we did. We were right in the same spot. We were right in about second place in both. So okay. Yeah. So and 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 you know you talk about the EQ. Something that was kind of a shock to me as I reached adulthood and really started started to study. Uh, getting a job, and it's something you, that... Oh, oh, you reached adulthood. Yeah. I thought he said, I read adulthood. I said, what the hell is adulthood? Okay. <laughs> no, I, I reached adulthood. Okay, I just and can't And it's hear. something that I've had, I've had to kind of revisit here recently. Let uh, me know what it's like. I'm thinking about trying it out. Don't. It, it's not great, honestly. Um, but it's something I've, I've had to, to kind of uh, relook at recently is finding a job. And I am a firm believer that the most important thing in finding a job is can you meet the qualifications to do the job? And the second most important thing to getting a job is does the guy interviewing you want to have a beer with you when, when you yeah, leave? Yeah, I agree. I think, that's, I think that's how we pick our presidents, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you guys have actually hit on a couple of things um, that I wanted to touch on in our next little section here. And that is why it is actually really difficult to design any sort of test to measure intelligence. Um, You know, one of the things you mentioned were were these maps that you looked at. um, And arguably, one of the reasons that um, I'm sure the pattern that you saw was that the more developed countries um, performed a lot better on IQ tests than less developed countries. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, And that's actually one of the problems that they've seen a lot is that as you're crossing cultures, um, you also saw that 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 it was it, 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 that that pardon me for interrupting you that the the more recently highly developed nations did better than the ones that developed earlier because you look at it India and China are are developed but they're fairly recently developed right. and they scored incredibly high England Canada the U S we developed hundreds of years earlier and we seem to be on the on the lag on this. Yeah. Uh, well, so, and it makes you wonder if there's a level of stagnation in yes, our... Is there an evolutionary process to, yeah. it, to it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, what one culture may consider to uh, signify a high level of intelligence may be considered to be commonplace in another culture. Yeah. Um, well, and, and, and another problem uh, uh, along the same lines of where I'm pretty sure you're going here... Mm-hmm. Uh, is whenever you look at these these IQ tests in the area, it tends to be uh, w- middle high middle class and above, predominant race students. Yeah. So in here it'd be it'd be mid uh, mid to upper class and above white college students yeah. in America, and you know maybe in Africa it's, it's black students, but it's the predominant mm-hmm. uh, uh, race who who is in power. And who who has uh, wealth? Yeah, and, and, you, and you wonder if everybody takes the test. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so are poor Hispanic and Black people uh, being underrepresented in these tests? First of all, and uh, or Asians even. Yeah. Um, and second of all, uh, does how what is the the wealth divide? So, are you testing a very small percentage of the population who are wealthy, or is do you have a fairly uh, 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 yeah, well balanced uh, wealth across a nation, mm-hmm. so a bigger portion of people are getting tested. It, they also, you know, schools have gotten away from IQ tests in the mm-hmm. last twenty years, and in the same way that there's a there's actually a pretty big movement in education to get away from standardized mm-hmm. testings. Now, yeah. outside of education, it's still massive, so mm-hmm. so it's still doing it. But in education, they're trying to get get out of both of them, and both of it is for the same reason: is that there is uh, there there's a. a, a an ethnic bias to to these tests a lot of times. Yeah, they are written largely by, at least in in, in the Western world, they are written by and for wealthy upper middle class uh, or upper class white people, and your lower classes don't have the experiences to understand the questions sometimes, mm-hmm. and th- that that's been a hit on on both IQ tests and standardized yeah. testing. For example. Even if, even if somebody from a lower class is smarter, they might not have the life experiences to mm-hmm. understand the question. Like with uh, the test that you described earlier, John, of giving somebody $10,000 and telling them to invest in the stock market and use that as a measure of their level of intelligence. 
where somebody who is middle or upper class um, may have a family member who's already involved in that. Um, they are going to be much more familiar with the, Just the very value concept. of $10,000 in the stock market. They'll be more familiar with what that even is. Um, whereas somebody in a lower socioeconomic place um, is not going to have that background information and is likely to perform poorly on that test um, simply because they're starting from a lower point. Yeah, I, I, oh. had, a, I had a grandmother that was, was very poorly educated, elementary education, you know, very, very poorly educated. Uh, she's been dead for a little while now. But she, uh, she could not, uh, she wouldn't put her money in the bank even. She, mm -hmm. she, she kept her money because she didn't trust them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she was an old farmer and she could go out and tear the tractor apart and put it back together again without any problem at all. Yeah. She was not a stupid woman. She just uh, didn't have the life experiences. Yeah. Well, and, and, and that's why in a test like that, and, and kind of what I was getting out of, do you mean a quick test or not? I think you would need a, a, a prolonged period of time for them to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and how well can you do in figuring out? And yes, I, I do understand what you're saying of any test we gave. Even if we yeah. sat there and made an alien language and said, y you need to decipher this, yeah. maybe their dad's a cartographer. Yeah. But, you know, you yeah. know, what if, let me ask you this, if your test was, <laughs> I'm going to give you $10,000 to go put it in the stock market and or, or to go invest this, and I took $10,000, put it in the stock market and, and made, you know, 2% on it or, or mm -hmm. whatever. And, and John said, fuck this, took the $10,000 down to the pool hall, put it all on, on, on one game of pool and ended up making $20,000. Mm -hmm. Does John score higher on the IQ test than I do? I think, I think that depends on what was the goal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If the goal was to how quickly can you do it in a day, yeah. Yeah. But if the goal was, you know, can, can you make, you know, long-term sustainable growth, yeah. then, then no. Yeah. I think I said the wrong word. Didn't cartography have to do with maps? Yes. I, I think I, I said linguist. Well, I think I meant crypto. Cryptography, cryptography. Yeah. Okay, but, also that. but either way, but yeah, yeah, I, I used the wrong word, but I just want to go back and correct myself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I wondered about I that. I corrected at first. that in my head. I yeah. heard cryptography. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but you know, and you you reference well, you know, we would do this over a longer period of time. But again, you give somebody a month, and if they're starting from point A, they have a lot further to go than somebody who's starting at G. I you agree. Know? Yeah. I agree. And so, even over that period of time, now maybe you, you handicap can, it. <laughs> Maybe you handicap it. Um, maybe your argument is that your ability to um, to invest in the stock market and, and get to the point where you can do that in a, a profitable measure is what intelligence is in that culture, um, which is another problem. You'll run into a culture that values... Um, being a strong negotiator. You'll run into another one that values, um, you know, supporting your community and your family. Um, and intelligence tests across those are not going to measure people in the same way. I'd love to see the guy that gets on that test and you go, okay, here's $10,000. You need to invest this. And just well, runs away. Whoever makes the most money wins. And this guy takes the $10,000, pays off his credit cards and says, I guess I lost. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? I'm stupid. You, you know, know? Oh, damn. <laughs> you know, I, and I think it's really interesting you yeah. say that. So we were talking about taking intelligence uh, IQ tests. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually taken a lot of IQ tests. In fact, I was a subject study for one of my teachers in high school. It was a thesis. A thesis, yeah. They were doing their thesis. Um, I score an IQ test in the top fraction of a percent among people. But I have, even from a very young age, you know, a, a lot of people take those IQ tests and they really let it go to their head. I mean, how do you know if someone passed the Mensa? Don't worry, they'll let you know. Yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well. Uh, in fact, if, you, if you're out there and you pass the Mensa, keep it to your fucking self. I don't care. Um, but all that said, um, I have always really resented those tests. And, and I said, even, even doing so well on them, I don't give a fuck. It's bullshit. Because whether or not I'm willing to score well on a test means nothing if I'm not able to actually accomplish things. If you can't apply it. Yeah, yeah and my yeah. IQ test is, did I make the right decision in quitting my job? Did I get a new job? Yeah. Did, I, did I solve this problem as an engineer? That's what I see as my IQ. Yeah. And I don't actually care well, what the number that comes out on a test is. Yeah, there's it's kind so of a cumulative that. representation of 
the things that you've done over the course of your life with the information that you have right. both started with and acquired over time. You know, yeah. the interesting is to do one where, where, where they work, they figure out, you know, your IQ and then your EQ and then your risk aversion and all this. And they mm-hmm. kind of pull this together on something because, you know, you could have, an, have a great IQ mm-hmm. and, and know what to do, but have a low risk aversion and not be willing to put, put, put your money out there. Well, yeah. and, and for instance, I know people that are really smart that have a dream to, I'm going to throw, throw one out there at random, to open a restaurant, right? Yeah. And they spend their whole life uh, playing video games and living at mom and dad's house. Yeah. I don't care how fucking well you did on that test. You're a fucking idiot to me. Yep. yep. Yeah. I think you're an idiot. Yep. And then you have someone who does poorly on that test, and they go out there and they struggle, and they, they get that restaurant. You're brilliant. You're smarter than this guy. I don't yeah. care. Yeah. I mean, Donald Trump's president. Right, ex- exactly, <laughs> exactly, and you know uh, what? You know what? There, there's a lot of things right. he's bad at, but yeah. he had a goal. He did. His he did. goal was to be president. I think his goal is more than that. I think his goal is to rule the world. But uh, we'll 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 stay at president now. And For and now. while and and here's here's what I honestly believe. I believe he had no interest in actually running the country. No, I think he I, wanted. I believe he had interest in winning a race. Yeah, and. W- while he was very intelligent, whether it was because he put the right people around him or because he did it himself, he was very intelligent on his goal. That's an IQ. Yeah, Everybody's cool. looking and saying, he, but he's doing a, a, a shit job at the job. And I look at it and say, yeah, but he didn't give a fuck. That wasn't, his, that wasn't the job he was going for. No. So <laughs> he, he <laughs> the was, job he was going for is I won. He yeah. was very intelligent yeah. at the thing he did. Sure, sure. You don't get to that position if you're stupid. Right. Yeah. But he was, he was, he was not great at the thing he didn't care about doing. Shocker, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it sounds like there is an overwhelming agreement at this table that... That's a first. Right? That there are... because we're smart. Great minds think alike. (laughs) Different uh, types of intelligences. Right. Right. Um, So interestingly, there was uh, one of the first people who really started to study intelligence and try to figure out how it was that we could measure it was uh, Charles Spearman. Now, he proposed that there was one kind of comprehensive intelligence underlying all of our mental abilities. He called this the general factor, known later as the G factor. Um, It's different than the G spot, John, in case you were wondering. Well, I was actually about to ask, is the G factor at a particular place in the brain like is there a g-spot where <laughs> oh, your g-factor is hell i didn't I, I wasn't sure there is but it's not in the brain have they found it's the, real hard to find <laughs> have they found the g-spot that's my question has anyone been able to affect the g-spot i need to know this so um he started to to develop these tests um and they were intended to um <laughs> measure some lesser intelligences yep. um and his theory was that A person who performed well in one of these lesser intelligences, um, and that doesn't mean like a lower, it required a lower level of intelligence to get there, but that they were not the primary intelligence, which was the G factor. Um, So his theory was that if somebody performed well in one of these areas, they were more likely to perform well in all of these areas. Um, and that was because they had this underlying, I say underlying, and then I keep putting it above. Yes, it would be Not under, the point. underlying. Yes. Right in front um, of your boobs is underlying. This overlying G factor um, that contributed to their overall intelligence and would impact their performance on all of these. Um, there was a gentleman who, uh, his name was L.L. Thurstone, and he sort of uh, actually disagreed with uh, Spearman. And his thought was that there were actually several different types of intelligence. Um, And he expected when he started experimenting that he would find that um, somebody was really good at one type, but would not be good at others. And there would be sort of a range at the things that somebody was excellent at and the things that somebody was really poor at. Um, interestingly, both of these gentlemen actually found that there was strong correlation between being good at one and uh, that turning around and resulting in being uh, scoring really well in the others. So he, here's an interesting question. I don't know if you have any research on it, and I don't know that, that how much research there is out there. I'm going to throw it out there. 
is your baseline ability to learn set and what you learn is is very uh, uh, variable due to your neuroplasticity so if you grew up in a in a you know a, a tribe you'd be really good at making fires but if you grew up you know in the city you'd be really good at the stock market or is it that you're just born probably going to be good at the stock market and and if you have to be born in a tribal society you're just kind of fucked you know what i'm saying yeah that's that, that that's uh, been dealt with a lot in educational psychology mm-hmm. and uh, uh i don't know if you've had any in your I'm taking class, it right are now. You? yeah there's the uh the the old theory was the idea of an empty vessel. It's mm-hmm. what they used to talk about, or or a blank chalkboard might be what they, they say in class. Yeah, uh, but the idea was that you're born with 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 nothing. You're just an empty mm-hmm. vessel, and everything is poured into you. And and by the by the by age seven, everything that you are capable of learning is already kind of there. Mm-hmm. And beyond that, all you're doing is it, it's it's plugging it's in, acquiring new acquiring information, acquiring new information. But every your your basic fundamental idea is 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 all there. That has kind of gone out of vogue with psychologists now. Yeah. Psychologists now are are, are are actually going the other way and they're they're saying that there's there's a bit of, of genetic ability in there and you're born predetermined with these abilities and, and it's it's almost platonic now with the idea that, that you're born with this and we have to unlock it. So so, so let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Yeah. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to video games here, right? I know nothing about... I haven't well, played I, video games since Pong, so... I, I think you'll understand Same. this. You played Dungeons & Dragons, right? Yeah, I did. There you go. So you, you got your character stats, your mm-hmm, stamina, mm-hmm. your strength, and all this. Is it that you have so many points to allocate to stats, and you could take all those points and get really good at the stock market, but you have genetically yeah. so many points? Or is it that in each different area... You have like a minute max. You'll you'll you're gonna be this good yeah. at it, but you could be this good if you invested. And so, to, today, most of your educational psychology people see it as a cumulative number that you have. You got this much ability, and where you put you it can is invest up to you. it. In, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now that's again, that's not the traditional way. Yeah. When I was in college, mm-hmm. you know, 25 years ago. They were teaching it the other way. They mm-hmm. were they 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 were they were teaching the way you're you're discussing there that that your natural ability you're you're good at math. That was when they were still talking about hemispheres and right brain and left mm-hmm. brain. Yeah. that stuff's all gone now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they pretty much decided that that's bullshit. Yeah, well, and and there's um there's a lot of talk about like you can like anybody can get to uh, this certain level of skill in a particular area yeah. that. Some people may have to invest more to get there. Uh, kind of like the difference between talent and hard work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like if you have talent, you start at a little bit higher spot sure. than somebody who starts without that talent. But that both can reach pro level if they, you know, talent just or doesn't have, have to work quite as hard. If you're, you know, you've heard rich dad, poor dad. If you're born born to a, to a rich dad, you've got a, you've got a head start. You've got a leg up. But that doesn't mean that a poor person can't make it. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it, it's been really it's funny. It's harder. It, it, it's right. it's not only if you work; it's a lot of how you work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. So, so, for instance, I've been I've been going back. I was doing it earlier when y'all came up. I've been watching uh, 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 not Hell's Kitchen, um, uh, Kitchen Nightmares, Kitchen Nightmares. I'm so sorry. And it's <laughs> it's amazing to me how many of these restaurant owners I've seen that have done the job they've done for years, and then once they had someone guiding them. They learn more in a few days than they had in years before, sure. and and so you know, and you could sit there and, and fill around with piano and probably get you know where you can kind of play, and then you have someone come in and formally teach you. It's like oh, sh- I've been doing that wrong the whole time, yeah, yeah. and it, it's it's amazing how I've seen get, that in education a lot. Yeah. yeah, giving a little bit of information to somebody like hey, go in this direction can can make them so much smarter over an instant. Nothing about that person changed. Yeah. They were still working just as hard on learning that piano. You got a new operating system. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I I, I, have, I always laugh about those teachers that, that, that work so much harder to get nowhere. And I've, I've seen them. They, they, mm-hmm. they'll, they'll work 80 hours a week and get nowhere. And I can't comprehend it. Yeah. So um, moving on from Spearman and Thurstone, um, Gardner actually kind of diverged entirely. Uh, his name was Howard Gardner. He diverged entirely from the idea of a G factor and said rather that we just have several different types of intelligences. And this is actually the theory that you see. Um, I always like Gardner. 
Oh, yeah? I remember that from educational psychology, too. Yeah. He always made sense to me. <clears throat> but um, that's actually the uh, commonality that you start to see in all of these developments um, is that the prevailing theory is different types of intelligence yeah. that aren't necessarily linked. Um, Did Gardner have a theory on beer intelligence? I don't think so. He well, should have. He well, should let's... Have. Can, can we see if we can figure out our own beer intelligence? Is it a good spot there, Madam Mistress? Sure. All right. Because we're, we're about to, to finish off this uh, this one here. Who wants to start this one? I'll go ahead and start. We're right. drinking something shady from the Texas L Project in Dallas, Texas. Um, it's a porter. You know, I'm going to say it's good. Uh, it's not spectacular fantastic. Really? It's got a little more bitter than I like. It's 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 sweet and and, and you're looking at me weird and that's because I drink uh, uh, IPA. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you don't want your porter to, porter to be bitter. exactly. Yeah, it yeah. tastes it tastes a little more bitter than yeah. I would like in a porter. I see that. Uh, it's 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 got a nice sweet uh, uh, flavor when it first hits hits your mouth and then like the brown kind of overwhelms it and and the sweet almost leaves out and and you get a bitter in the middle and then it it, it almost mellows out and the, and the back end's really good so it's got it's got a little bit of a harsh middle a really good front and a really good back mm-hmm. um but and, and and i'm saying it's got a harsh middle it's not bad it's just not optimal if that makes sense okay I think I think though it's it's a little bit better than average. I'm gonna give it a two eight. Two eight? Really? Yeah. Really. Go ahead, Mike. Okay. Uh, there's nothing I don't like about this beer. Okay. I agree. It's got a bitterness to it, but I think it's I think the bitterness gives it character. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, a, a it's not a harsh bitterness to it. It's just that it, it gives you a little spike there in the middle, and I like it. I love the creamy overtones on the back end. Mm-hmm. I like the fact that it's smooth going down. There's not a lot of carbonation in this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm tasting. Uh, I want to say coffee-like taste. It's not coffee, but there's there's that that feeling to it, and I think that's what that bitterness that, that I'm picking up is like yeah. the bitterness from a coffee. And I'm a coffee guy, so I, I'm all for that. I'm going to rank this beer incredibly high. Uh, uh, just on the beer itself, I'm going to go a four. And the fact that they have the hot chick on the can, I'm giving another point. So I'm going okay. four one. Four one. Oh, okay. When you said another point, I just thought you were about to say five. I'm no, like, no, another, well, another another decimal point. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, four point one. Okay. Um, so I have thoroughly enjoyed this beer. I've had to kind of regulate my drinking of it because I want to drink it more quickly. Um, I also don't want to be toasted right now. So um, I've, I've had to slow myself down because it is really easy to drink. Um, it does have a little bit of a, a bite to it, a, a bitterness to it that I do think is uncharacteristic of a porter it with is. a porter you're normally going to get that sort of um molasses sweetness um which is still going to have the that bitterness but it's going to be a nice rich sweetness um that you're going to kind of get on that upward trajectory of flavor um so i think they could have sweetened this up just a hair um and it would have been more representative of a porter Mm -hmm. but i actually really like that it's not so sweet i do too i do too um it is really pleasant to drink it's got a kind of woody taste to it kind of smoky taste to it that i really really enjoy i think this is going to be a killer beer for winter time um and with the dreary weather that we've had here lately i think that it, it matches really well um all of that to say, I'm actually going to give this a 3.4. I think it is a really well-made beer. Um, it has a little bit of improvement that it could do. But if I see this again when I'm just kind of buying beer for the weekend or whatever, I'm going to grab it again because I really like it. So you all want to know what it is on Beer Advocate? Sure. Yeah. 3.8. 3.8. Okay. All right. Yeah. So Not too bad. I was a little high, but you know that's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of this. I really yeah. am. It's not a bad uh, beer. I mean, I, I, I sat say, there and critiqued it a little bit, but it, it's a good yeah. beer. I it will is. say you got to be careful with it because it doesn't taste like a five. Was it five point five ABV? Five point five. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't taste like that to me. Uh, it doesn't have that. Uh, I think it could sneak up on you pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's quite good. It's well, quite and good. I think this is one that you could have two or three of. Really enjoy. Um, it's, it is 
rich enough that you're not going to want to have a six pack of it by yourself. Um, Speak for yourself. Well, okay, fine. But um, it is it is a very rich flavor. It's a very full flavor. I think I would be very very full after. I would feel well, very yeah. full because it's heavy. It is. Um, it's a porter. So with that, I think you're not going to want to have a bunch of them, but it it's also just mellow enough that you could have two or three and enjoy yourself over the course of a night. I want to go to this brewery. Okay. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We've had a couple from there, and they've done, uh, not looking at the numbers right now, I seem to recall that they've done yeah, relatively I so well. I think so, too. You want to play our game? Sure. Um, will it get you laid? I think... I, I think it will contribute significantly to sealing the deal um, with a wide number of people, too. Um, I think that you can bring this to somebody who likes scotch or bourbon or um, uh, I was going to say brandy, but I, I think if it had that sweet aspect, then... You know, somebody who liked brandy yeah, might think, like this I think as well. your whiskey drinkers would like it. Yeah. Um, so somebody who likes scotch, bourbon, whiskey is going to enjoy this. Still got that woodiness that whiskey has. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that somebody who doesn't like a really hoppy beer is going to appreciate this a lot. Amen. Um, and so I, I think it's going to have wide reception, and I think it's going to go a long way towards sealing the deal. Um with anybody you are trying to bed. All right. So this this gets into a rare category that I've, I've mentioned a few times, but but not a lot of beers fall into it. This is a flex beer. There is no place I could drop this in that I'm like, yeah, th- this is bad for it. And there's no place I say it's just excellent for. But if you're ever looking for a great beer to, to, to bring to somebody, grab this. This could be first date. This could be last date. This could be your breakup. It, it, I don't think it's ever going to flop, but I also don't think it's ever going to like take you to level 10 yeah you know what i'm saying yeah, fair enough uh i, I lawnmower beer uh you know last mow of the season <laughs> last mow of the season it's cooling down a little bit this is perfect for that that that, that last mow of the season so uh yeah. it's a much better bonfire beer yeah, it's a much better bonfire yeah. beer uh but you know if drink you, a couple while you're mowing and the rest while you're doing the bonfire if you brought this to me i would mow your lawn i'm just saying nice you nice. provide the lawnmower, you provide the gas and the beer, I will mow your lawn. I'm just pointing, I, I want to point out right now that the lawnmower category of this game <laughs> is turning less and less into is it a lawnmower beer and more and more into if you give Mike this beer, will he mow your lawn? <laughs> well, that's, our new, that's our new strategy. So uh, I just want to know, if I give you this beer, will you do my laundry? Is, is this a laundry beer? <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. If you'll throw what about in, fix my dishwasher? No, my dishwasher. If, if you'll throw in a bonfire in the backyard between between uh, between lawnmower or, or between uh, laundry, <laughs> laundry yeah. and lawnmower. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's me. gotta have a bonfire with gotta it. Gotta have a bonfire with it. But uh, yeah, sounds good. A bonfire where, and a beer, you can get your laundry done. There nice. You go. Where are we in this uh, discussion, Madam Mistress? Let me pull that back up. I was over here taking notes on the beer. Uh, so anyway, so we were talking about Gardner. Um, he kind of splits this into he abandons the G factor idea and he says we have several different intelligences. Um, he cites the the fact that um, something we see a lot of times whenever somebody sustains a traumatic brain injury is that maybe a specific function um, will be severely damaged with everything else remaining intact. Um, similar to that, he also, uh, references savant syndrome. So the idea that That, that's me, is it? No, (laughs) no, not at all. No. Okay. Um, so he references savant syndrome where a person can have, can be functioning below what is considered normal in almost every other aspect, except for maybe they have, um, I just forgot the technical term for this, but a photographic memory. Maybe they are, maybe they can do lifelike portraits. Um, you know, maybe they can have memorized um, with great ease every baseball stat since baseball started having stats. Um, <clears throat> or any I have none of those abilities, by the way. None of them. Okay. None of them. Um, but they have like this one ability that they are 
unbelievably good at. Um, so citing that information, he said, we don't have one general intelligence because if we did, then when you suffered a traumatic brain injury, you would lose all of that or all of that would be damaged. Yeah. Um, and you wouldn't see things like savant syndrome. Um, we then had um, Robert Sternberg. So Howard Gardner actually identified eight different types of intelligence. Um, Robert Sternberg kind of trimmed all of that down into three different categories. Um, and then and one of his categories being creativity, which was something that we hadn't been measuring a whole lot of up until this point. And then he further broke creativity down into uh, five different components. Yes, which is eight, by the way. Which is eight? If you have three and then you break one of them down into five, he ended then up... Then you have seven. seven. Five and... One you're is right. broken you're into right. five. You're right, you're yes. right. But he's breaking... But what I'm saying here is he's... He's got about It's the same. not really different. But it is different. I remember this in college. Because there's one that explores... Yeah. Uh, there's one that's broken down into five different aspects. Yeah. But if you relate it back to Howard Gardner's eight, yeah. those aspects aren't... They don't line uh, up. Yeah, they yeah. don't line yeah. up. Um, and then, uh, like we mentioned earlier, we were talking about emotional intelligence. Um, that was actually um, sort of developed, this idea was developed by uh, John Mayer and Peter Solovey. Different John Different Mayer. Different John Mayer, yes. Different. <laughs> Around the same time, now, right, now, I think? Now I want to hear the song Daughters really badly. Eh. Go ahead. Um, in like 1997. But if we played it, they'd pull us off the air and on, on YouTube. Yeah, so. right. Um, so we've actually seen um, a, a significant development of intelligence theory uh, with Spearman starting in the 1800s, going all the way uh, almost to the turn of the 21st century. You know what was amazing to me uh, when I started moving to politics and uh, got a wife and... A what? Yeah, well, yeah, you know. Um, you and, did, and you like, didn't know about her? Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, is is the fact that not only does emotional intelligence exist, because it, it wasn't something I was really valuing, uh, and, and job, that was another big one, uh, but that it's something that you have to train and develop. It's not just like yeah. a thing you have. Um, if anyone out there is looking to develop their emotional intelligence, I, I highly recommend the book How to Win Friends and Influence People by Carnegie. Um, but the the fact that not only is You this, could also hang out at strip bars and talk to strippers. <laughs> I want to hear that That's theory. a thing you can do. <laughs> you can. It exists. You can, you can. Yes. I learned how to talk to a lot of people that way once upon a time. But the, but the fact that not only does this, this thing exist as a type of intelligence, yeah. but that it's a type of intelligence you have to study like every other type of intelligence. Mm -hmm. Sure. I think that's that while we're just now starting to see that it exists, I don't think society is caught up in valuing it and developing it oh, yeah. Um, yeah. in the way that, that we probably should Which be. Which is amazing because Carney's book's old as fuck. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. it's still so, – it's, it's amazing – Looking at the references in his time yeah. and applying them to your situation today and realizing how little has changed yeah. in yeah. that field. It, it's a dry book, but it's really good. It's, it, yeah, it, yeah, yeah I, I used it in a class once upon a time. So I actually want to kind of um, take a look at the development of uh, types of intelligence um, and compare where it was that they changed. Because I think one of the things that you'll see is a development with the time. Um, so Thurstone, uh, still in the 1800s, um, he had seven different types of in types of intelligence. Uh, they were spatial, verbal comprehension, word fluency, perceptual speed, numerical ability, inductive reasoning, and memory. What's perceptual speed? So that was essentially like reaction time. It was okay. the time with which, uh, between which, a muscle memory, well, no, like a, a stimulus, was presented to you, and you recognizing and reacting to it. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, so that could be a picture, that could be uh, pressure applied to you, that could be a sound, um, but it was when when that stimulus came about, and when and how you reacted to it. Yeah. Um, so those are all very concrete things, um, that, that Thurstone was looking at. Um, 
whereas we moved on to Gardner, who had uh, musical intelligence, mathematical intelligence, uh, linguistic, naturalist, interpersonal, intrapersonal, yeah. spatial, and kinesthetic abilities. Yeah. This is the one that they were really, really pushing when I was in college. Yeah. Well, and I took a psychology course in high school where this was, that was actually the first time I had seen this. Um, and what I found really interesting here is that this is where you start to see the divergence of recognizing the intelligence of um, social interactions. Yep. And that's there in your interpersonal and a little bit in intrapersonal. Um, one that I never really, like I get, but it's interesting to me that they included it was naturalist. Yep. Um, which was your intelligence about the world, the natural world. Not even like the world around you necessarily, but like being able to identify animals and plants and, and I guess how well you would do if you were stranded on an island. Not necessarily desert, but like... Just an island without population. Well, and something really interesting to me about what he's saying there is it seems that we're starting to really re recognize, and, and we did it a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. your ability to move mm -hmm. as an intelligence. And, and I've actually seen some really interesting research that points to evolutionarily, the brain was designed uh, primarily to move you from point A to point B. And we're seeing a lot of research that links physical fitness and muscular fitness to your intelligence uh, in that one of the biggest workouts you can do for your brain is working out. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that was actually something I wanted to touch on here as well, was you see for the first time an intelligence called uh, kinesthetic abilities. And that was very much related to your athleticism. Um, you know, so how good at you were how good were you at throwing a ball or, um, well, that's throwing a ball too. I was going to say like making a basket yeah, or, yeah, yeah. or kicking or passing or whatever it is, all the things involved in ball sports. Um, <laughs> all the things involved in ball sports. Uh, Mr. Producer, save that. By the way, Shut up. by the way, I have an update. So I just finished uh, putting out the video for Black Holes. <laughs> and I remember how you were, were very giddy over black holes and white holes. Yes, yes. So the software we use for tagging our videos, oh, it's got these little indicators of, like, putting this tag may, like, raise <coughs> flags with, uh, with Google yeah. oh, to get God, your video no. demonetized. Everything with black hole in it had a little... Uh, <laughs> For real? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I put terrifying. them on there anyway. I don't care. That is but, awful. But yeah. <laughs> risk of getting demonetized from black hole that's terrible. in your text. That's terrible. Yeah. So... Um, Fucking then, YouTube. Then we move on to Sternberg, um, who had three different categories. He had analytical, which essentially was problem solving. Um, creative, which was your ability to adapt to new situations. And practical, and I found this one so interesting. Practical was how you execute everyday tasks. So this is the first time that we actually start to see a measurement of, um, you know, you see, we've talked before. I don't actually don't know that we've talked about it on the show, um, but I know that I've had conversations with people about, well, so and so is book smart, but they're not street smart. Oh yeah, yeah. and this is actually kind of measuring what we consider as street smart. Um, so not just your interpersonal skills, but can you figure out how to replace the transmission on your car? Um, no, I can can't. you fix your dishwasher? Um, you know, can you kind of handle things in your everyday life? Well, and you know, when we talk about street smarts, a lot of what I think about, uh, obviously the, I think emotional intelligence does play into it mm -hmm. heavily, but I think also they're they're speaking to and i don't think a lot of people that use the term know what i'm about know the terms i'm about to use but they're speaking to the elephant rider uh balance mm -hmm. in your brain and i think people who tend to be uh more elephant minded mm -hmm. and and i'll explain what that means in a minute tend to be considered not street smart mm -hmm. and people who tend to be more rider oriented 
uh, tend to be considered more street smart. Uh, so the elephant rider psychology is that you have two minds, uh, one that just reacts, just you, you you see you see a, it's when you're sitting there and there's a cup near you and it's not your drink and you just go and you drink it and you're like because that that elephant oh port- that was a spit cup that was disgusting yeah, the elephant portion of your brain said I'm thirsty there's a drink nearby I'm gonna grab it and drink uh, the rider is kind of your thinking mind that 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 thing you access when maybe you're playing a game of chess and and the the psychological analogy that's set up is a rider sitting on an elephant trying to direct it the elephant's going where it needs to go and and that rider has to like pull the reins because it's an elephant it's just going to kind of you know wander around where it wants to and I, I think people who you know what we have the term like a ditzy or you know blonde moment or whatever i think that's people who don't think about what they're doing actively they just kind of react to things and then you're like yeah, i know why you reacted that way there there's like this mental connection but no the wolves of dementia are not <laughs> real wolves <laughs> Oh, hey John, what a soup look, of the day, mate! The look we just got. So, yeah, what a soup of the day. Uh, yeah, uh, wolves of dementia. Yeah. So, and then um, John Mayer and uh, what's his face, Sil- Silovi. You did it to me Silvi. again. Oh yeah. Yes. Now did it's playing in my head again. Thank you. Good. Ha. Nice. Um, oh, there it was. Yeah, Peter. Sil- John Mayer and Peter Silovi didn't really um, develop their own list of different types of intelligence. They just kind of added on emotional intelligence onto their, Oh, Oh, uh, Oh, Oh Sternberg. I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, his measures of creativity as an intelligence. Cause I found this fascinating. So those categories were expertise. Um, so a high degree of knowledge about a topic or topics, um, imaginative thinking, Um, so seeing things in new ways, recognizing patterns and things like that, um, venturesome personality. So we were talking earlier about, uh, risk aversion, uh, which I think when you are looking at, um, quitting your job, starting a new business, any, any of those things, um, you expect to have to require some amount of, of venturesome nature, um, but I don't think that we tend to look at those as uh, aspects of creativity on the surface. But I think whenever you start to actually break it down, it does require somebody to uh, see things in different ways and be able to look at innovative ways of implementing their own their existing knowledge. I really hate the idea of somebody being risk-prone or risk-averse because I know people... Who would not go out and start a new business? Would try and jump in the cage with the tigers at the zoo. Yeah. And I know people who would never jump in the cage with the tigers at the zoo, but would go out and start try and start a new yeah. business. Yeah. Which one of those is risk prone? Yeah. Yeah. So and and I think probably we need to to think of a, a better term of like risk assessment or risk balance yeah. because both of those are high risk. Yeah. yeah. One of them doesn't have good reward. Yeah. I know guys that would never You get dream. to be friends with a tiger. Of course there's a good reward. No, you don't. You don't get to be friends with tigers. <laughs> See, that, that's why they fuck up. The, the tiger doesn't be friends with that's you. That's right. That's right. That's right. So the other You get two, to be lunch. <laughs> if you want to be friends with a tiger, you need to go start a business in Vegas where you make friends with tigers on stage and hope they don't maul you. And then they bite your face off. Yes. Yeah. Don't be stupid and they won't. God. You talked to whichever one of Siegfried and Roy got stabbed yeah, or bit. bit. He didn't get stabbed. <laughs> he, gets, he got yeah. stabbed with I teeth. I got this the image of this, <laughs> this, this, this tiger. Like He shanks him. <laughs> he got stabbed with teeth. What are you talking about? Uh, <laughs> he readily admits it was his fault. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it's anyway. definitely his fault. He got up on stage with a fucking tiger. Yeah. <laughs> the guy who jumped in the zoo with a tiger, he should probably admit it's his fault too. There's nothing wrong with that. Hashtag remember Harambe. Hell yeah. Although Harambe was not a tiger. Gorilla. He was, he was a gorilla. But you know somebody a got silverback a, gorilla. Somebody got in a cage and with it was a gorilla. A child. But anyway, he had bad risk assessment. Bad risk assessment. As Harambe didn't to. do anything wrong. That is absolutely true. He saved the kid from getting drowned. Yes. I'm just saying. Uh, so anyway, the other two categories there are intrinsic motivation um, and a creative environment. Um, so I really like this idea of intrinsic motivation because I think that is something. When you think of creative people, you tend to think of artists, right? Who in theory, are not making anything of any value to anybody. Um, 
not my theory, but yeah. Well, they're not um, producing a yeah, they're not, usable product. Yeah. That shit's not usable. It's just pretty. That's what, I was pointing at my painting on the wall, his, by the way. That's what it's yeah, useless. I don't know. That shit's not usable or useful. Fuck yeah, it is. <laughs> I mean, okay. I mean, if, if if you're gonna argue that, I think we should all live in in houses with, with without any paint on the walls. I mean, it should just be insulation and structural uses, and and I mean anything else waste. But but clearly, clearly, somebody people, found a useful found a people useful. that live in nice houses reproduce more. Yeah. So. Maybe there is a use. Fine, you can you can break it down to that point. But the point being, peacocks have pretty feathers for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> but the point being, um, you tend to think of artists when you think of creativity, and what was the pur- purpose of the statue of David? You know, um, and well, I guess there is a lot that of art that is commissioned, but non commissioned art. Um, you have to be intrinsically motivated yeah. both to come up with the idea, to take the time and effort, and some of it significant effort to this show. make this this fucking show. Yeah. Well, and, <laughs> and you know, you, you talk about you know it being a waste, and you know I mentioned uh, ability to reproduce more, also the ability to connect people emotionally or intellectually. If you really want to talk about a w- wasted skill, learn to play bass. They get laid though. Yeah. Really, not, I think not, not as much as the lead guitar. I think, but, they're, you know. I think they're picking up drummer leftovers. <laughs> wow! And we just lost all the bass players. What? All four of them? So anyway, um, and don't play me a sad song in a low key. Yeah. <laughs> and then the last one being a creative environment. So um, Sternberg posited that um, in order for these other four categories to uh, thrive you had to have a creative environment. Um, Whether that is a family structure that is supportive of the creative efforts you're uh, doing, um, or it is funding to um, make the art that you've, you know, that you want to make or any number of other things, uh, maybe a governmental structure that doesn't burn all the art or whatever it is. Um, Reichstag. Yeah, exactly. So those were, uh, that, that was just kind of the breakdown that I wanted to go through. Some interesting, fun little yeah, points. Yeah, interesting stuff. And the different types of um, intelligence that people have identified over time. Still not taking an IQ test. I actually think that would be really fun for us to do. God. As like Are a we going to take video. like an internet one or a real one? <sighs> We can try to take a real one. Cause, cause like it depends on how much they different. fucking cost. I don't know who this we is. I'm not taking an IQ test. Because a lot of them, I don't even know how you reproduce on the internet. A lot of them, they'll give you these uh, these you abstract... Go to, you go to Pornhub yeah. to reproduce on the internet. <laughs> well, a lot of them, they, they, t- they don't reproduce, then they lose their jobs. Oh, that's true. Um, that's true. Yeah. But, but, um, no, then they get moved to pregnant porn. <laughs> <laughs> but the, they'll, they'll take these like abstract puzzles, yeah. and they'll put you on a timer for, you know, Two minutes. They're like, okay, put this puzzle back together. I hate puzzles. Yeah, and it's it's funny because the whole puzzle has like twelve to twenty pieces, so you'd think it's pretty easy. Put yourself on a two minute timer and put together a puzzle you've never seen. I don't yeah. want anybody to to have a fact that they can point at that I'm the dumb one on the show. Well, and that was actually um, I fuck those facts. They're alternative facts. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Fake news. Hashtag. Yeah. So I do actually want to take a moment and explore uh, the, d- the historical development of IQ tests a little bit, um, which we'll get into putting yourself on a timer because that's fun. Um, so it started with Francis Galton in the 1800s, um, who was related to Darwin. Um, and he, this guy, so he actually kind of pulled from Dar- Darwin's ideas of, of natural selection and, and whatnot. Um, and he held that intelligence was hereditary. And because of that, we should be um, making smart people reproduce to create a super race. That's what Margaret Sanger said, too, in the eugenics movement. He coined the term eugenics. Hmm. So, probably a good guy then. R- real good guy. The start. Hitler of, thought so. Yeah, he did. The start of all of these IQ tests came from this guy, who started u- the eugenics movement as well. Another reason not to take an IQ test. 
Don't support <laughs> Nazism. <laughs> Uh, so following uh, shortly it's after him, eugenics, not Nazism yet. <laughs> one of his uh, mentees was James Cattell. Um, he wanted he actually had a less eugenic -y, um <laughs> goal. You know, it's, it's interesting because when I think of a mentor, I think of someone who taught somebody. When I think of a mentee, I think of somebody with great breath. <laughs> anyway, um, so he wanted to develop a test to determine less um, eugenic. -y. Which students in school needed more attention? Let us know if you want that to be a T-shirt from Six Pack Philosophy. Less eugenic -y than the other. <laughs> yes. The least eugenic -y podcast on, tele on, on television. We're a podcast on television Fuck yeah. now. Fuck Whatever. Yeah. Nice. We'll do it. Um, he also held a, an interesting theory that um, <coughs> all of our mental ability was derived from uh, sensory input. So that... <coughs> No, um, no information that we had, no intelligence that we had came intrinsically that it was all, you know, you learned the stove was hot because you touched the hot stove. Um, or you saw somebody touch the hot stove and go, ow, that's hot or whatever. The um, smart ones can watch. That's what I <laughs> yeah, always right? do. I always throw my hands in the air and go, ow, that's hot. <laughs> we know. We've seen it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but so he argued that better perceptual ability led to better um, mental ability. And with that, he developed one of the first IQ tests. It had 10 parts. So the first one was, and you'll see a theme through all of these, was could you tell a difference in weights? So he would, you know, put a couple of different weights in your hand and, you know, see which one is heavier. Um, the second point would be at what point does the test subject recognize um, pain from a uh, pressure applied to them? Third being uh, the distance at which point two pressures can be differentiated. So they'd start out really close and the further apart you go where you can say, okay, I'm being touched in two different places. Uh, he tested grip strength, reaction time to sound. You can't look at her, it doesn't work. Yeah. I, I, I was trying to... I, I, I don't it's know. a lot closer than you think it is. Huh. Yeah. Um, reaction time to sound. Or a lot further apart than you think it is. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, Movement speed of the arm. Just like how fast you can move your arm. <laughs> I want to see this <laughs> I know. Fast. I know. Uh, maybe that's the IQ test we should take. Uh, no. Um, speed of naming colors. So how quickly, when you're presented with the, these colors, can you name them? Bob, Jenny, James. <laughs> 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 um your ability to to identify the midpoint of a line, um, your ability to hold things in your memory for a short period of time. Oh, I'm screwed. And it it was like they put up a set of letters for a brief period of time. You'd look at them and you'd try to store them in your mind and then recall what the letters were really quickly. And judging the passage of ten seconds. So, what is the theme that you see in all of these? They're physical. Yeah, they are, they are all physical. You're right. Yeah. So, well, except for the judging the passing of ten seconds, and memorizing things and naming colors. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I, don't I don't see that theme. Well, honestly. no, I guess you're right. Yeah. I don't but know. Yeah. there's the vast majority of them are physical. Um, pressure, uh, weights, which whatever. I don't Grip think that's strength, fair. Reaction time to sound. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. But they're all coming from sensory. They're all perception. sensory input. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So he actually expected to find a correlation between their performance on this test and their academic achievement and interestingly found no correlation at all between Yeah. That's why I fucking hate IQ tests. Yeah. yeah. They fucking inflate the egos of people whose success correlation has nothing to do with it. So while some people who do really well on it uh, go on and, and do great things. A bunch of fucking idiots get told how great they are, too. I got to tell you, if y'all make me take this test and I qualify for Mensa, I'm going, I'm getting tattooed on my forehead. <laughs> I will pay for the tattoo on my forehead. <laughs> I don't... Wait, hold up. Do you have to take a... I, do I you have to take an IQ test to qualify or can you just take the Mensa? I don't know. Okay. Please me. It doesn't matter. Um, so, that was... Uh, back in the late 1800s. We move on to the early 1900s and we have uh, Benet and Simone uh, in France. Now, they were commissioned around the time that France started requiring students to go to school um, to develop a test 
to determine where these students should be placed because a lot of them had never actually been to school before. Um, so they're trying to kind of figure out, you know, what do these kids already know? Um, that include taste good? <laughs> <laughs> Um, now, these these are actually the gentlemen who termed coined the term mental age, which is probably something you've heard of before. Um, you know, so and so has a mental age of six, even though they're twenty five or whatever it is. Um, now, there's some. I, I actually saw some differing reports on who it is they, that they were testing. <laughs> Were they testing all of the kids going into compulsory education or were they only testing the ones that seemed to be having trouble? But the overwhelming consensus is that their goal here was to identify where in the education system these students should be placed and, um, and, and nothing more than that. They weren't trying to say who should get to reproduce and who shouldn't. Um, and I totally just lost my train of thought. Um, but anyway, one of their concerns was that in doing this, they were actually going to um, kind of pave the way for people to misuse this information, which ended up happening really shortly thereafter when uh, William, William Stern actually took that test and developed what we know to be the IQ. And this is um, the, the way that it comes about is... You take the Bennett and Simone uh, intelligence test, and it gets your mental age. And you take your mental age, divide it by your actual age, and multiply it by 100. So if your performance is at your actual age, then your, uh, your IQ is 100. If you are six years old and performing at a four-year-old level, it's under 100. If you're six years old and performing at a 10-year uh, year old level then it's over 100 well and that's a really good point to point out about these iq tests because i, I didn't actually know how the scale worked mm -hmm. i knew that 70 wasn't passing but uh <laughs> but i didn't i didn't know how the the scale works that's interesting but one of the things about it is these tests are really meant to be administered on children yeah and i mean honestly you got to think about it knowing that scale now if i was to score a you know 300 on an iq test that means I have the mind of a ninety-year-old. Yeah, you know, which is not good. No, <laughs> it's not like, like at a point you you want the thing to start going down. Yeah, I got a thirty IQ and I'm proud of it, but I'm ninety. So, so that was the case in the early 1900s. Um, that is actually not what that number is anymore. Yeah. Okay. Um, though there is a lot of misconception that that is the case, um, which is where you'll hear a lot of well, IQ tests are only meant to be administered to kids because they're kind of operating from that earlier standpoint. Um, Lewis Terman actually took the work that Stern did um, and kind of bastardized it even further. Um, he promoted using Stern's test um, all over the nation to the point that uh, the U.S. government ac actually implemented it to be used on U.S. Army recruit or Army recruits in World War One. Yeah. Um, they saw some success in this, and then he further pushed for it to be used on uh, immigrants and the poor. Yeah, I wanted to use it for sterilization policies and eugenics. Yeah. Exactly. He was a big advocate of forced, coerced, and covert sterilization. Like, yeah. not even supply. telling them that they were going to be sterilized, but just doing it because you know better than they do, apparently. Um, you know, I always think it's funny. Very few of these people come up with these, these coercive policies before they take the test. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, a few of them are like, yeah, you know, let's do this, but I wonder how I'll score. Yeah. And like, now, something that I do want to point out, because we're actually kind of getting up to World War II times here. Um, so... There were laws that were getting put in place for forced sterilization in, in a few different states. Some of the programs were, by the measures of the, the law and the goals of eugenicists, really successful. I qualify it that way because I wouldn't personally consider that successful. I think it's fucking terrifying. Um, but by the goals of the people who wanted them implemented, they were pretty successful. Um, and it was around the time that they started to see what the fuck Hitler was doing with it 
that they went, oh, oh. Yeah, bad guy. Maybe not so good. We don't want to look like Hitler. Um, and I do also want to point out one of the, the big critiques of um, IQ tests is that Hitler used them. Um, but there Which was... Which I think is a, a shit critique. It is. Hitler drank water. Well, that's fine. But there's actually a, a, a more solid refutation of that critique. And that is that um, the IQ, the intelligence test, and that's podcast air quotes for anybody who's only listening, um, that the Nazis were administering were not really seeking to measure intelligence. They were seeking to measure your adherence to social norms. Yeah. Um, so though they claimed that they were intelligence tests, when you looked Almost at the questions, they were more EQ than IQ. Yeah. Um, but even not, not so much like your ability to assess the emotional state of others um, and be empathetic and that sort of thing. But uh, the ability to be a cog in the machine. Yeah. They ask questions like, uh, what does Christmas mean to you? Um, Because, you know, for Jews, it didn't mean much. Um, (laughs) But so two two weeks off. (laughs) Yes. Two weeks off. Um, I was about to make a terrible joke. I'm not going to do that. Um, So anyway, we moved on to uh, 1941 with Raymond Cattell. There are actually three people who very quickly kind of dovetailed off of each other that led to what we know as intelligence tests today, more or less. Um, So that was Raymond Cattell, John Horn, and John Carroll. Um, Cattell referenced all the way back to Spearman's idea of general intelligence. Um, but what he did was he kind of um, split it into fluid intelligence, intelligence and crystallized intelligence, which, again, looks kind of like, though not a direct analog, for street smarts and book smarts. Uh, fluid intelligence being your ability to take in information um, or to kind of solve unfamiliar problems um, through abstract thinking and reasoning. And crystallized intelligence being a lot of knowledge, which going all the way back to the beginning of the show, kind of talking um, about you were saying, Mike, about how your son is really intelligent and you just know a lot of stuff. Yeah. And uh, Cattell would have said he has a high fluid intelligence and you have a high crystallized intelligence. Okay. Um, which one of the arguments uh, they actually made with this was that if you are categorizing in these ways, what you see is that fluid intelligence actually uh, goes down over time, whereas crystallized intelligence is not really responsive to age until you get into, like, dementia and serious memory loss. Um, There you go, Mike. You said you are having trouble recently? (laughs) I'm telling you, it's rough. I should have not mentioned that. I'm (laughs) sorry, Mike. Uh, But anyway, um, and and you do kind of see that that fluid intelligence going down. Now we can argue why it is that that happens, but like it's easier to learn a new language at younger ages than it is earlier ages. Um, you also see, you know, the idea that you can't t- teach y- y- an old dog new tricks. Younger ages and earlier ages are the same thing. It's easier to learn. You guys knew what I meant. I know, but I wanted to clear it up for the audience. I was ta- I was talking to our audience. It's easier. They to... are intelligent enough to know what I meant. I don't know. I don't know what their <laughs> fluid or crystallized intelligence is. It's easier to learn <laughs> at a younger age than an older age. Than an yes. older age. Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, now, uh, John Horn came in right behind him. Um, he actually believed we that we could require our audience to take an IQ test and send it to us. <laughs> no. They would never do that, and I wouldn't blame them, especially after you refused to. Yeah, um, I am right. So John Horn came in right behind there. He said, there aren't actually two intelligences. There are ten. Um, and um, almost immediately followed by John Carroll, um, who took both of those pieces of information and put them into kind of a hierarchy with uh, the general intelligence on top, the um, ten categories underneath, and then splitting that into 70 categories below that. Um, 
And then our final one and the test that actually people are using today um, is going to be what was developed in 1955. So at this point, we're looking at 70, 65 years-ish, 63 years of um, using this test, which is pretty much the longest that any of these one tests has been applied. Um, And that was David Wexler. Um, He developed the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale and the Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children. Um, And he kind of, he put a bunch of different things together. And this is actually the scoring metric that we're using now that we were kind of talking about earlier. And he essentially just said, all right, guys, 100 is your... Uh, yeah, that's your baseline. That's your medium. That is where um, that is going to be right down the middle. One standard deviation away from that is going to be 15 points on either side. So you're looking at 85 to 115. And then, uh, you know, your second standard deviation, he said, you know, 2.5% of people are going to go on the uh, above 130 and the other 2.5% are going to be below 70. Yeah, that's right. Um but the numbers that he picked were kind of fucking arbitrary. He set these numbers, did a bunch of testing, and said, okay, this is where you guys fall. Um, and then assigned their numbers to them. I think that's probably that. actually more accurate because he, he, you know, he, he said, look, this is, a, this is where the majority of people are going to be. I'm going to test a bunch of people. Yeah. And then I'm going to put a bell curve, and this is where you are. Yeah, well, and that's what they do with standardized testing. Yeah, yeah. You know, they create a test. And they say, okay, the vast majority of people here are here. There's a higher set here, and there's the, you know, far yeah. out ends here. Yeah. Um, and then they put your scores uh, across that, yeah. you know. So it, it really is uh, more representative of what we do today. But it also would change over time. Yeah. yeah. So with that information, we're going to wrap this up with uh, jumping back to the question that we asked earlier. With the information that we have now, would the way that you would construct an intelligence test change at all? No. No. Wouldn't do it. You wouldn't do it? No. You'd say, fuck you guys, yeah, fuck no. you and your $10 billion. I'm not making one. No, I'll make one for $10 billion. <laughs> it, it won't take me long either. But uh, The IQ higher. test is, would you take the $10 billion? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. But, all right. Uh, if you wouldn't, you're a dumbass. <laughs> well, that's kind of everything that I have. Um it was kind of a fun discussion. I, I, I didn't know where it was going, so it was interesting to me. Isn't that fun? Just it, go it is, to the right. It is. Uh, I didn't have to prepare for this one at all. I just kind of kind That's of jumped unusual. into it. Yeah. Before we close out, I do want to mention we have a podcast recommendation this week. Oh, oh we, we do. haven't had we one do. of those in a while. From so, our, our producer. Yeah, our producer brought it to us. This one's called Fiction. It's by Jason and uh, Fictional. Carissa. Fictional. Sorry, Fictional by Jason and Carissa Weiser. Um, and they basically take a bunch of classic literature. And they kind of look at it with a modern tone. Uh, they have a, a list of, of some of the stories. They do Dracula, Time Machine, Three Musketeers. Sounds awesome. Yeah. So uh, if you're into that kind of thing, uh, you might check them out. I haven't they, listened to it yet, but I'm going to. They also do an, another similar one called Myths and Legends. So, I have which listened to that one. we actually recommended before. Yeah. So if you listen to that one and you liked it, go check out yeah. Fictional. Myths yeah. and Legends was awesome. So, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm excited about that. Yeah, Sounds bad. good. So, anyway... Um, if you enjoy the show and you want to be a supporter, you can uh, sign up at patreon.com slash sixpackphilosophy. Um, you can also check out Teespring and search Six Pack Philosophy to get any of our fun, super cool swag. Um, you can find us on social media by searching Six Pack Philosophy there. Um, that's really all that I have for you guys today. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We've had fun and we hope you have too. Cheers. Cheers. Six Pack Philosophy is supported by independent philosophers just like you. If you would like to support us, go to sixpackphilosophy.com and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. 